Given the current situation in Ukraine, I was just curious about your perspective on the new narrative you hear in the media that this is somehow rekindling the Cold War and the tensions between Russia and the U.S. is somehow uh, Cold War-esque. Um, it's a good, it, it's, a, it's a valid question. I mean, again, I think unfortunately in the post-Cold War period, there has been uh, a degrader um, degree of tension persisting between Western countries and Russia than there needed to have been. Some of this is, I, I mean, blame for that is on both sides, I think. I don't think it's one side or the other that is strictly to blame for that. But the, um, uh, but it's unfortunate, I think, there wasn't a greater effort made to integrate Russia more fully into the West. Um, it's probably not possible under Putin. Um, but in the 1990s, I think it would be, have been, and it might have prevented someone like Putin from coming in. Having said that, though, let me, uh, I, I do want to address specifically the question of Ukraine. Ukraine has often, in the Western press, I think, been depicted in black and white terms as somehow pitting a pro-Western good side against a pro-Eastern, uh, you know, sort of bad side, including the government, um, especially of Yanukovych. I mean, I think it's a, a grayer situation than that suggests. Y Yanukovych was clearly a uh, corrupt, incompetent thug. Um, and, and frankly, I'm glad to see him gone. But at the same time, I have to acknowledge he won in a, a free election in 2010. Um, so the one thing I hope is that in Ukraine now, mass protests don't become the means of deciding who holds power. Because so far, they have been twice in the recent past. Um, in 2004, it was quite different. In 2004, the protests were against blatant electoral fraud. So um, in, that, in that respect, I think it really was a much more black and white situation. That um, it was a clear effort by an illegitimate regime to hold on to power. In this case, Yanukovych, for all of his grievous failings, you know, had been elected and the next election is coming up in a year's time. So um, in that sense, I think you have to uh, look then quite closely at what some of the protesters are seeking. And uh, many of them do want something like what I would call democracy. Some of them don't. Um, and there are some fairly extreme nationalist groups that were involved that I actually worry about, you know, what their role will be in the post, uh, the, the situation that will be emerging, maybe not now, but later this year. Um, but uh, with regard to Russia's role, Russia has, uh, Russia, I think, you know, if you went to Russia and watched what was happening in Ukraine, you received a highly distorted view of it. The Russian television presented it as just fascist and Nazis revolting against the legitimate government. I mean, there too, it was presented in ridiculously simplistic terms because the large majority of protesters were, were not part of those extremist groups. You know, the large majority were perfectly honest and I think um, basically well-intentioned people. Um, so. Russia uh, had an even more unhelpful and simplistic case to make about the protest. Part of that is Putin is nervous, himself, very nervous himself, that there might be the rise of such protests in Russia. Elections, unlike the election that occurred in Ukraine in 2010, elections in Russia are neither free nor fair. Um, there hasn't been a single election in the last 15 years where people didn't know the results in advance. Um, in fact, you know, it's already been announced what the result, I'm just joking, but this was actually put on a Russian website, the results of the 2018 elections in, in, uh, in Russia. They, they already put up the results of it. You know, it's obviously a joke, but it gives some idea of the way people in Russia regard their own elections. Um, the, uh, so part of it is Putin's nervousness about that. But, I, you know, part of it is also uh, Russia borders on Ukraine. It doesn't want to see a strongly pro-Western government in Ukraine. It also is worried about what the advent of real democracy in Ukraine might mean. 
um, because it would then lead a lot of Russians to question, why can't we have this here? So Russia over the last 22 years or so has basically tried to keep Ukraine subordinate to Russia. Um, but Ukrainians ultimately have determined their own fate. You know, if you look at Bulgaria nowadays, Bulgaria is not what I would describe as an economic powerhouse, but, you, uh, but, but Bulgaria, if you compare its 1989 uh, per capita GDP with what it is today, Bulgaria is a richer country now than it was back then. Um, that's true of every former communist country with one exception, which is Ukraine. Um, Ukraine, compared to where it was in 1992, it's about 30, its average GDP is about 30% less than it was then. Um, that's Ukrainians who have ultimately been responsible for that. And that basic economic situation is not going to change in the near future. It gives Russia enormous leverage in Ukraine. The Russians supply about 70% of Ukraine's natural gas. The Ukrainian government highly subsidizes it to Ukrainian households. And that means that to continue those subsidies, the Ukrainian government goes deeply into debt. Most of those debts are to Russia. Um, so Russia does have a lot of cards to play in this. Unfortunately, it doesn't play them usually for the better. Um, Russian foreign policy under Putin, I think, has been has, uh, conceived of the world in much more zero-sum terms. And it therefore may have to await a new leader in Russia before an effort can be made to integrate both Russia and Ukraine more fully into the West.